Nashville, Tennessee. So I feel like, I don't know if Texans approve of me. Like, I'm Southern enough still that, like, I'm, I'm in the fold, you know? But um, I feel like we're kindred states, Tennessee and Texas. But um, I grew up there and had a very, like, pleasant Christian upbringing and um, life just kind of got crazy after that. And so I'm just going to tell you my story today and tell you kind of how God has revealed things to me throughout the past few years and, and kind of how I feel like I've been transformed by the Holy Spirit. Um, and so I remember growing up in church, listening to my preacher, who's named Steve, and he would say things like, um, you're either like in a crisis right now or you're coming out of one, you're going to go into one soon. And I was like, that's great. I'm so excited. Like, you know, I was like, that's sort of, are you serious? You know, and, and never thought it would be me, you know, like my life's so good. And, and, you know, I had two wonderful parents and my older sister, and we just had a really, a really nice life and a lot of love and had a lot of fun. So I just didn't imagine that that could apply to me. And, um, I just, I always thought this is about someone else, not about me. This can't happen to me. But after suffering sort of crises of my own, walking with God through suffering has become something I really love to talk about because people didn't, I didn't have classes about this when I was younger. And, and so when you're faced with things that are really hard to overcome, you're like, what do I do? You know, nobody's told me about this. But, you know, for me, faith and suffering has become like my assignment because um, there's, a, there's a lot to, to wade through when you're going through things like this in your faith and with the Lord. So I just want to highlight some things that I've learned and insights I've gained along the way. And so I guess I'll start out by telling you what happened. So I, I went to Harding University and met my husband there. who He's the coolest guy ever. Very handsome, talented. I feel like he got all the awards, and I was, like, kind of annoyed about it. But I was like, I mean, I guess I'm getting a catch here, so whatever. Um, but, you know, we just really encouraged each other, and we're just such a good team. And I thought, man, I can't wait to see what, how God's going to use us and what we're going to do. And I remember people saying that to us, and I was, I was like, yeah, me too. It's going to be awesome. You know, and we had plans to go to graduate school and um, – I was going to do clinical mental health counseling, and he was going to do, like, film and creative media, because he's, like, this actor, drama. He's actually a licensed educator, but, you know, he had, he's just really good at everything, and, of course. So we kind of had these plans to, you know, like, get a good foundation on our careers, and, um, you know, we wanted to start having children eventually, and we really wanted to be foreign missionaries, and so... I was telling David about it yesterday, and I was, he was like, you probably thought you were like going somewhere cool like to Africa, but you're just here now. And I was like, yeah, but you know what? You can still be a missionary right where you are, and I'm learning that too. But, you know, we had all these plans that we felt like um, God would be proud of, and we were really excited. But in August of 2015, so we got married in August of 2014, graduated college in May of 15. So this was about three months after that. So we hadn't been married that long, just over a year. And, you know, we were really just getting started with life. And um, we were up in New York at a wedding rehearsal dinner. And it was really good because we were seeing our friends after three months of being away from them and um, kind of reconnecting and telling funny stories and just having a great time. And basically, suddenly I was getting communications from people like you need to go out and see the guys like something's wrong you know and I kind of knew as soon as I saw one of our friends faces that something was wrong with Harrison you know and what happened was uh, the groom was driving in a four-wheeler and he was like come on Harrison get on get on he's like no thanks no thanks and he asked him a third time and finally Harrison said okay and Basically, he, the guy driving didn't know the terrain very well and drove them kind of off this ravine. It was about like eight feet. So they, I don't know exactly what happened, but Harrison became unconscious with a brain injury. And so that's how I found him, was face down in this ravine. And it was terrible. 
and it just kind of kept getting more terrible as time went on. Um, I got to the hospital after Harrison and the neurosurgeon was like, I'm not hopeful for him. You know, I don't think he's going to make it, but we're going to do the surgery and we're going to try, you know? And I remember thinking like, I'm, I'm going to go home a widow from this at age 22. And like, that's going to be who I am now. And I'm going to lose my best friend and love of my life and favorite person. And it was just really awful. I try not to think about it very much because that's not a place you want to go back to. But um, over the next three months, Harrison uh, remained asleep. He didn't open his eyes. He would move and have some like purposeful movements, it looked like. But we just, we didn't know if he would ever wake up. But we were trying everything we could. And it was during those three months, every day, I prayed, especially in the shower. <laughs> I don't know. We talked about yesterday how that's like a time when no one can bother you and you can sort of focus. And I would just say, Lord, if you'll give me back my teammate, I know I can get through this. But I feel so alone right now. And he he's laying in a bed and he can't communicate with me. He can't help me. And I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and finally, it was November 20th of 2015 um harrison started identifying words like arm leg um we put an alphabet in front of him and he could identify the letters which was great we didn't know any sort of we had no idea how his cognition was and we didn't know if he even knew who i was and and so i remember thinking like i really hope he still loves me you know things like that and uh so they, once we figured out he could identify letters and words, they put this iPad in front of him where you can kind of like type with some assistance and it was a really slow process. But I remember the speech therapist was like, um, you know, spell your name for us. And I thought, I don't know about this, you know, we'll see. And, and I hear from over across the room, H A R R. And I was like, no way. Like he, <laughs> He can spell his name and, and that means he can talk to us. So for three months, I had just been wanting to hear from him. And finally, this was the moment. I wish I had the video because I was just bawling a total puddle of tears. But um, it, his therapist said, what do you want to say? And he said, he typed, I love you. And I was just, yeah, I was like a puddle on the floor. I, I remember saying, I'm the happiest person who ever lived right now in this moment because when you lose something that you love and it and it or him comes back to you it's the best thing ever and I, it made me think later on down the road about how God must feel when his children are lost and they come back to him um what a celebration that must be but um that was a huge moment, but it wasn't what we expected. You know, I was, it's not like in the movies when people sort of pop out of bed and they're like, what's up? I'm awake. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's not like that. Um, I thought, man, he's in there, but he can't move his body very well. Um, even to type, he had to have some assistance with his arm and things like that. So I started to recognize that this was going to be a very long recovery for him physically and it was going to change everything forever and that's a very hard pill to swallow i think i kind of had to take in increments like okay I, i'm starting to realize little by little that this is not gonna be easy for us um and during that time i had so much fear i remember just feeling physically ill and you know, when you're really anxious, how your body just sort of shuts down. And um, I remember praying to God and saying, I want to be 100% faithful. And if I'm 100% faithful to you, then I'm not going to be afraid at all. Because what's the worst thing that can happen to me? Harrison dies, he goes to heaven. I die, I go to heaven. I mean, you can't do anything worse to me at this point, And I'm I'm going to be faithful. I'm not going to be afraid. <laughs> and I truly haven't been afraid since that time, that time where I really had to evaluate how I was feeling, um, which has been such a gift, but not easy to get there. Um, so I knew I was about to become this caregiver 
I called Lipscomb University and I said, I'm not coming to grad school. I was like, I'll defer, I guess. No, I never went. Um, I've got to take care of my husband now. And I'm really grateful that I had the opportunity to be home with him and care for him. But, you know, he was in the hospital for about five and a half months and then it was all on me. So I had to learn how to feed him. Um, he had a trach, so I had to learn all that. Um, how to like shower him and make sure his skin integrity wasn't compromised. You know, um, if any of y'all have been caregivers before, you know how it is. But um, it was very overwhelming at 22 years old to be in this situation. But the Lord blessed me tremendously with strength and with perseverance and with incredible support from my church family and friends. But, you know, I think I probably spent about two years just in a panic as far as like, I'm trying to survive, I'm trying to survive. Oh, Harrison ran out of food, that's my job. You know, like, um, I gotta, you know, just trying to do the whole caregiver thing, I was a mess at it. And I think that just took so much of my focus for a long time that I wasn't able to sort of step back and see what was happening, um, what God was wanting of me. You know, I was just trying to survive and, and go through the motions and get it done and make sure Harrison was okay. So after some time and trying to, I guess, settle into it, you know, recognize it as a new normal, I started wondering, you know, Lord, what is it that you want from me? Like, what do you want me to do? I understand that I'm committed to my husband and I, I need to be by his side and care for him. I, I get that. But like, how does this play into your story, you know? And I knew from the beginning that God wanted us to glorify him through this trial. And I think I, think I recognized early on that Harrison wasn't going to get back to who he was, back to his full capabilities. And I thought, man, is this going to be one of those things <laughs> where, you know, we just like suffer strong in the Lord. I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want this story. I had this whole other plan, God, a good plan where I was going to sacrifice everything that I had and go and evangelize to different people, right? <laughs> I thought, I don't know if you got this right. <laughs> But I started to think about the truths that I did know. Like, maybe I didn't know what I was supposed to do, but I, what do I know about the Lord? And I thought, well, let me go back to Scripture, because that's where the truth is. So if you want to turn with me to Matthew 26, we're going to start in verse 36. And I'm going to drink a sip of water. So I thought about Jesus because, I mean, he's my ultimate example. So I thought, well, what did Jesus do when he didn't want to do what God asked him to do? <laughs> so he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, starting in 36. And I'm going to read it here. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And I was like, Jesus, I feel you. <laughs> then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. So I remembered that. And I thought, man, Holy Spirit convicted me. I guess I just got to say, like, I'm going to do it. Your will be done. I don't want to do this. Harrison doesn't want to do this. But we're going to we're gonna do it for you. I don't know what plans you have. But I trust that whatever you see, um, we're going we're gonna to make it happen here. We're going to do what you want us to do. 
And I also had times, <laughs> I wasn't always that like mature about it. Um, I had times when I was really mad because I just thought we were so sold out for you, Lord. What are you doing to us? You know, like, why did you allow this to happen? And at first I felt sort of guilty about that. But then I went to the Psalms, and I'm going to read some out of 13. If you want to join me there? Um, one of my friends from high school wrote a song inspired by Psalm 13. And I remember just singing that because it starts, you know, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? Um, and as time passed on in this new normal that was really hard and really painful, I started feeling like, are you going to just, like, do you remember me? I couldn't feel him with me sometimes. And I'd say, like, how long will you hide your face from me? Like, show up for me and help me here because I don't see it. Um, and he, it says, how long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day? And that's how I was feeling, um, you know, and some, most Psalms, I feel like have a resolution at the end where they're like, well, I've trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And I will sing to the Lord because he's dealt bountifully with me. Um, some Psalms don't have quite the resolution like that. And that's how I felt sometimes. I'd be like, I'm just mad at you. <laughs> I'm just mad. Um, but you know what? I think. I think God wants to hear from us no matter how we feel because he loves us and he can handle it. I mean, um, but that's something I learned because I used to just feel guilty about bringing the Lord my hurt feelings, um, but he can handle it. And, and I just really appreciate that about him because he wants a true relationship with us. And sometimes that means we're taking him, our, our sadness and our hurt feelings and our anger. <laughs> um, so, I have all these feelings, and, and I'm trying to settle into it. And again, I think, what do you want from me? How do I respond? Not my will, but yours. What does that look like, Lord? What does your will in this situation look like for me? And I also remember the truth that I found in James 1, 2 through 4, which has always been one of my favorite verses, but like, I didn't have any trials, so I was just like, cool, God, you know? That sounds great, but until you um, experience something like this, it, it doesn't quite take on the same meaning. But it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And I looked that up because I love the definition. Steadfastness means being resolutely or dutifully firm and unwavering. So let that unwaveringness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And I started to realize that sometimes God allows things to happen for it to change my heart, right? For me to be transformed, to be more like him. And this verse really illuminated that for me. And I thought, man, that's really kind of awesome. Like, this hurts really bad, and I really don't like it. But what I love is becoming more like Christ, right? Like, how can I look past my grief to see the goodness that's coming out of this? And James really helped me do that. And I hope what you're seeing here is that the word that was so dear to my heart my whole life made me remember the truth in these moments. And I don't know what I would have done without that. And, you know, I remember these truths despite the hurt and the doubt, but it can be really hard to overcome that. That's where a lot of people get hung up with the Lord is, why'd you let this happen to me? I'm so hurt. Um, how could you let this terrible thing happen? But the truth is in the word. And some truths that I always remembered, and some of these have like a chapter and verse, but some of them just don't. God loves me. Does anybody doubt that the Lord loves them in this room? No. You know that. And I know, I said, I know God loves Harrison. And I know he wants good for us. 
You know how I know that? Because it says it in Romans 8, and I'm going to read it. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And I said, Lord, you called us for your purpose. We are going to give up everything. And you know what? We did. I mean, in the end, it looked a lot different. But we're here for your purpose, and we're going to serve you. Um, I also remembered that God goes before us and has a plan for us. He can see way ahead, and he can see behind. And I knew if he let this happen to us, happen to Harrison, there must be some good reason. I truly believe that. That's a really hard thing to, to be okay with, but I, I really, truly believe it. And then I remembered that he's always with us. We can always depend on the Lord. He never leaves our side, even if I can't feel him with me, which I don't even know how to describe that. But do you guys ever feel like the Lord is with me, like I feel it? Yeah. Um, there are just times where I didn't feel that way. Um, but he's always there, always waiting and waiting for you to talk to him. And like that makes me excited because I like the idea of the Lord just like waiting for me to speak to him or delighting in me because he does that with all of us. He loves to hear from you. And I just think that's really special because he's so big. Um, and, and one thing that's really neat about this is Harrison. So I found out late months later that Harrison actually heard everything going on around him from the day after his accident until he was like pronounced emerged, you know, which to be emerged, you have to be able to do meet two criteria. One is to like manipulate an object. So like bring a cup to your mouth or something like that and then communicate. So he was able to do both those things and was officially pronounced emerged um, three months after his accident. But all that while, he heard every single thing we were saying to him. He heard the doctors say he probably won't wake up and he might die. He heard me crying. I tried not to do that too much, but you know, like there are a couple days where I was like on over him, bawling my eyes out. Um, he heard it all. And he said, I tried to talk back to you in my head. Of course, you couldn't hear me. But he said, you know who was always there for me? God. I prayed constantly and he never let me down. And I was like, man, that is, that is something special that you have Harrison, because I, I have a tendency to want to like go talk to my friend Connie over here or, or even, you know, our spouse is like Harrison. I would make him such a priority and want to run everything through him first. Right. But the fact that Harrison can't do that with me, makes him immediately go to his father, which I think is awesome. And it's something that he's taught me and encouraged me with uh, throughout this, you know, past five years. But I thought, man, that's so special. And, and he does that all the time now. He's constantly praying for other people. I always tell people at church, I'm like, if you're struggling, just like go whisper in Harry's ear. Nobody has to know. <laughs> he's not going to tell anybody but the Lord. So you go for it. <laughs> but I think that's just so special <clears throat> and something we kind of forget about. Anyway, so here I am. I'm having these like small revelations as I move forward, but I'm, I'm still like, Lord, what is it that? Like, how can I serve you here? Because I felt so isolated for so long. Um, I mentioned yesterday that Harrison's brain just, like, can't take the stimulation of even going to church for a long time. It was just too much. You know, the singing, the all the noise, the people surrounding him. Hey, Harrison. Ah. You know, it's just way too much. Um, even still, you know, we have to be really calculated about what we want to go to, what we miss out on. You know, we have to kind of prioritize. And two church services is about all he can take on a Sunday. Um, but anyway, I got so isolated in that. And I felt so far from the Lord and so far from his church. And um, I was trying trying my best to, to do what I needed to do. But I felt very purposeless, you know. I felt like I'm going through these motions. I'm taking care of Harrison. But how am I changing the world at all? Like, how am I making a difference or encouraging anybody? 
And that's when um, I kind of started to get approached by people. Um, I used to update on Facebook, you know, these big, big old paragraphs, like, here's what's happening with Harrison and whatever. And everybody loved it, of course, so I just kept doing it. They're like, hey, we, we want an update. Like, old ladies would hound me if I didn't do it often <laughs> enough. And I was like, can y'all chill, Susan? Like, oh my gosh. Anyway, so updating. And, and finally, I was starting to have, you know, these like epiphanies, I guess, or like insights that I felt like were from the Lord. And I felt it so strongly that I said, I really need to share this. So I started blogging. <laughs> and just writing and and I liked that because I could be very calculated and edit myself and I could think about it for a long time and I was good with it um but then one day somebody said hey can you come speak to our uh high school bible class for girls and I was like no 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 Haley doesn't speak okay like I'll write you something but I was like I don't speak and in fact in college <laughs> My speech professor was like, Haley, you're really bad. <laughs> and I was like, it's fine. I'm never going to speak anyway. Well, here I am. Um, but, you know, I, I felt what I believed to be the Holy Spirit nudging me to, to do it. Because I thought, I mean, what if I am a terrible speaker? Um, I have a message to bring, right? So I thought, okay, I'll do it, Lord, even though I'm uncomfortable and it's kind of inconvenient. <laughs> kind of had a bad attitude about it but what I realized was there are people who needed to hear this story and they needed to hear how God doesn't abandon you and they needed to hear what kind of blessings can come out of tragedy right and I, and that started giving me this purpose and this meaning you know no longer was I isolated to my home where I felt like I did nothing for anybody else. I was able to take this experience here and and take Harrison's life. Like, I remind him, if you were dead, baby, none of this could be happening, right? I said, your life is so special, even if you don't feel like it. Because look, look how we're able to share our faith with people now. So it's just been incredibly meaningful and purposeful for us to be able to take this message out to others. And I'm grateful, Connie, that you, you know, had me speak today and yesterday, because um, that really helps us to feel like we're we're doing our assignment, you know. Um, but yeah, so I've been speaking, you know, I guess over the past couple years, um, and it's just been such a huge blessing. So I want to tell you, if you feel like you're not adequate enough for what God's calling you to. Just do it anyway. Mm -hmm. If he's calling you to it, he's going to make sure it's great. He's going to make sure it goes really well. And that's why, literally, I, I spoke at a church, like, I don't know, a couple months ago. And I, I was on the way from work, which my, my workplace was like six miles away from the church. So I was like, no biggie. I got off at 5.15. Or maybe I got off a little earlier, like 5, because church started at 6.30. Yeah. So I'm going and... And it, traffic was just awful, because welcome to Nashville, it's awful now, because everybody wants to live there, but traffic was bad, I was texting the person who was coordinating with me, and I was like, dude, I'm sorry, like, I'm coming, uh, traffic's awful, and I had to change out of my scrubs when I got there, and I, my makeup was all smushed, because I had my mask on all day, and my hat, and everything, and I was like, I look terrible, but I was like, I'm not worried about it, you know, like, I'm not going to freak out, I'm not worried, because God's going to take care of this. Um, I'm as prepared as I can be, you know, in the word and in my notes. Um, but like God's going to take care of it. So I just blew in there with five minutes to spare and change really quick. And I was up there on the stage. So, um, you know, it's just not so much about how adequate I am, but how much the Lord can just use anybody to, to spread his message. Right. Mm -hmm. And I want y'all to know that because he uses every single one of y'all and, it doesn't matter, you know, what, what you think about yourself, really. And so, <clears throat> so what are we doing right now? Just to give you an update, because I'm sure everyone's like, what's Harrison doing? How's he recovered? All this. Well, so Harrison, he still cannot walk or talk or eat. He can eat some things like applesauce, but like not enough to, to be nourished, you know. Um... 
but we've sort of just resigned to it. Um, we, we do therapy with him every single day to try to strengthen him and, and help him keep getting better. But I think Harrison and I now have realized our time and energy is better spent helping other people than trying to help ourselves. You know what I mean? Like, this is really important to us. Like, spreading the message is really important to us and helping encourage others in their faith. And I think that's kind of where we are emphasizing our lives right now. Also, I didn't go be a counselor. You know, I didn't do that. So after a few years of caring for Harrison, I was like, oh, I guess I have it in me to like do nursing or something. And I was like, let me just apply to this nursing school. And I got in and I was like, I'm doing it. So um, I'm a nurse now and I really love it. Um, and it, it gives me an opportunity to kind of meet people in their illness and their injury and just be with them and be like, I know how it is, you know, like, I know this is really hard. Like I've, I had a patient Wednesday who had a tumor behind her eye and I thought, I know you're so scared. Like I know what it's like to see somebody I love go into neurosurgery, right? Um, and I was like, I promise I'm gonna take care of you in there, you know, and um, I just love, I love, being able to meet people when they're vulnerable and scared and say like, I, I got you, you know? So that's been a huge blessing in my life too. I feel very fortunate that God gave me like such a cool job where I can be compassionate with people and love them. So as we continue to move forward, these are the things that I want to emphasize in my life. I want to create meaning by partnering with God to bring glory through this story. Um, Becky said yesterday, when you become a Christian, you step into God's story. And I was like, that is so true. Um, because we, we all have our own different stories, but we're all part of God's story, right? Um, how God has come into our lives and transformed us for the better, how he saved us. And so that's something I want to continue to do. Um, and then I also want to really focus on what I do have instead of what I don't. We lost so much. Um, you know, we, we couldn't live on our own anymore. We sort of had to fall back into being a little more dependent. We live with my family. Um, we, you know, is that the five minutes? Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, we, we lost so much. We lost our dreams. We lost our future. I lost so much of my husband um, and have had to learn how to love him in a new way now. And um, it's, It could be very easy to focus on what I don't have, right? But I once heard a woman whose husband also was brain injured, and she said, if I can just be thankful for what I have, it really produces a contentment in me. And I was like, okay. So <laughs> I was like, I hear that. So I thought, you know what, I'm just gonna wake up every day and say, Lord, thank you for this, thank you for this. Like, thank you for my house that I can live in. And I sleep in a big king size bed with Harrison now. Thank you so much. Because for a long time, I slept on the couch <laughs> so I could hear him because he was in a hospital bed in the front of the house. No, couldn't do that anymore. Thank you, Lord, that we sleep in the same bed. That's huge, you know. Thank you that I have this job where I can provide insurance for him and make money for us. Like, wow, thank you so much, Lord. You know, there's always things that you can be thankful for even if you're hurting deeply. And so I try to really think about those um, and also what we can do instead of what we can't. I remember we, so like in June, my family, we have chairs just like this. And so we'll, we'll be the, the team that sets them out on Saturday, you know? So I was doing that, me and mom and dad, and Harrison was off in the corner and I thought, man, I bet he feels frustrated that he can't help us with these chairs, you know? But I went over to him and I said, you know what, Harry, you know what you can do? I said, remember how you're really good at praying? I was like, how about every time I sit down a chair, you pray for the person who's going to be sitting in that chair tomorrow? So that's what he does. Yeah. And I'm like, that's so special. That's a lot more special than me setting out chairs. You know what I'm saying? So um, really focusing, like Becky said, on what you do have, what you can do, because we can all do something. If my husband who can't move and talk can be praying and, you know, talking with the Lord about people, we can all do something like that. And, um, and like I said, again, just being thankful 
because we do have so much to be thankful for. God has come and saved us, and I'm going to heaven. So, like, I'm pumped about that, you know. Um, and sort of thinking with this eternal perspective has really helped me move through this time. Um, so as I close, I just want to encourage you to get in the Word of God and find the truth for yourself. Um, having the truth written on my heart is what helped me shake the devil off my foot quite a few times. And then I want to encourage you to know God, who He is, and His promises. Sometimes I just think about His promises, which are, you know, like, He's going to love me, He's going to be there. Um, he sent his son so that I could go live with him. I'm like, sweet. Um, things that really help keep me encouraged. Get in the Word, spend time listening. Go to God in prayer, and he will reveal himself to you. It's really special. And don't, keep, don't give up. Keep pressing on. There's work to be done and souls to be saved. And, you know, what's the best thing you can do with your life? Is you can save somebody, right? You can go to heaven and take everybody with you. Bring somebody to Christ. And, you know, I want to say one thing. Uh, I've been, like, really gung-ho about heaven. I'm like, y'all, peace out. Anytime, <laughs> like, anytime you want to take me, Lord, like, I'm ready. And I realized um, at church on Wednesday night, I was like, that's so selfish of me. Because Paul says, um, it's better for me to live, keep on living on the earth, Lord, so I can bring more people to you. And I was like, Woo. <laughs> I'm convicted because I've just felt like I'm tired of this, the pain and the hurt that this life brings. But the Lord, if I'm alive and I got breath in my lungs, then I've got work to do, right? Mm -hmm. And I want to kind of celebrate that I'm here and able to do that work. And that's just something I've learned in last week. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> um, but yeah, no matter what you're going through, you can, you can do that. You can bring somebody. You, you have a story to tell always. You've got your story and it'll touch people and it'll and you can incorporate the Lord's story into your own, of course, and, and really help change lives, right? And lastly, one beautiful day, we will see our friends and our families and others we've helped lead to heaven. And the things we experience on earth won't matter so much anymore, but our souls will be where they were always meant to be with our God in heaven with our church family, right? So on that note, I just want to pray for us and we can leave. Lord, thank you so much for this day and for these women. Please, um, please continue to encourage us when we are going through hard times. Help us to not give up, to keep pressing on, to do the work that you've asked us to do, no matter what stage of life we're in, no matter what our abilities. Um, I thank you, Lord, for blessing me by being here and uh, being with these wonderful people who I'll see in heaven one day, and I'm excited about that. Um, please be with us as we all go home today or, um, you know, traveling, and um, just bless us. And, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your love and for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>